for each other, sustainable communities, how um, we can keep them sustainable and, and remain as much as possible radical in, in our work. And I will think of, I think, I think of that as the art, as the art today. And so here we're gonna, you know, try and 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 talk to people who've really kind of uh, done this um, uh, well so far, and um, and so that they can talk about you know proper mechanisms and models that are actually out there to take us a step closer to where we want to go. And I'm I'm gonna. Um, bring up Nat, uh, call up Nati Linares, who's done a lot of the, the research um, behind a, a report called art.coop. She'll introduce that, but that has put together um, a, lot of, a lot of resources and a lot of groups that are doing the good work. So Nati, um, take it on. Oh, cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Nati. I'm from uh, Staten Island. Really happy to be in this group with uh, New York folks um, and connect the dots between um, artist-led resistance movements and all that Strike MoMA and MoMA Divest have been doing and connecting that with the worlds that we do want for arts and culture. And so just really um, excited to be able to connect these dots and, and bring some of you all into the work that is happening in New York City right now around solidarity economy and co-ops. So you'll be hearing lots of examples and you'll be hearing about networks and it might be very overwhelming at first, but I just want to encourage folks to, to dig into these groups and these networks on the ground and these initiatives and um, just super, yeah, excited to be here. I come to this work as a cultural worker. I worked in the music business for 10 years and and my goal with even doing events like this is how do we bring more of us into solidarity economy and co-op work? Um, I'm, I'm now at the New Economy Coalition, which is a national network for solidarity economy groups in the US, um, neweconomy.net. Um, and there's just so much of a gap still, even within that world and arts and culture and the efforts that, you know, groups like MoMA Divest are doing on the ground for artists. So just really excited that these worlds are merging and this is a preliminary start. And, you know, I'm really uh, psyched for you all to dig into uh, what you're going to be hearing today. <clears throat> yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here with us today. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you to Divest MoMA for all the amazing work that they've done and for the invitation. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about um, a new a movement to build a solidarity economy, an economy that can actually deliver on justice, freedom, equality, sustainability, um, and one that can actually, and to learn, you know, to, to uh, spread the word about some of these really exciting experiments going on with um, artists and with art and culture makers within the solidarity economy space. So, uh, I will give a quick presentation for you because we want to uh, make sure you can see several of these resources. So, yeah, we're going to be talking today about how exactly can we get from here to there, right? What does a just transition to a community-based future for the creative economy look like? So, why am I here? So, I'm here to talk to you uh, about this event, both an economist and someone who thought a lot about the arts. So, I'm a Dominican New Yorker. I was raised. Um, in Harlem. Uh, I'm now a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. My research was in the political economy of currency unions in West Africa, which I can talk your ear off about exchange rates and interest rates if you care to, but I'm, more importantly, I'm here as a solidarity economy popular educator who works with social justice organizers and artists. And I used to work as a, as, as a grant writer at the Museum for African Arts, so I've been thinking about who funds the arts and why for a very long time. So I'm, you know, I'm also a lover of the arts. I'm, I'm, I'm married to, to Nati. I have the great fortune of being her partner and being a father to a 20 month old toddler who sings beautifully. Um, he can't speak, but he can sing. Right? So think about what that means for the importance of the arts. First, we wanted to take a moment of silence to just acknowledge and thank all of those who have struggled for worker rights. Um, and racial, economic, and environmental rights and emancipation around the world. We really do stand on the shoulders of those who do solidarity and cooperative economics and culture and the struggle for liberation. 
The following list of some of the folks who have led the way for us. So people like Ella Baker, James Baldwin, Grace Lee Fogg, Barbara Dane, W.E.B. Du Bois, the Combahee River Collective, Sandy Lee Hamer, Lorraine Hansberry, Dora Neal Hurston, Paul Robeson, Zico Hara, Shirley Sherrod, Tony K. Bambara, Nina Simone, Comandante Ramona, Elandria E. C. Williams, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhart, and many, many others. We do this work as part of a long legacy of many of those who have struggled, and we will continue it on. So we're here to, again, talk about a just transition to a solidarity economy, right? So we wanna, um, you know, help you understand why artists uh, need, need, a new solid, need a new economy, need a solidarity economy. We all know the creative economies are messed up. The pandemic really exposed the rot uh, in our overall economy, but specifically in the way that artists and cultural workers are mistreated in our society. Um, we saw that they were many of the ones who bore the brunt of the crisis. So it's clear that artists need a, a new economy, but the solidarity economy also needs artists, right? We also need to help people understand what this could be, um, that this is possible, um, that you know we need to change hearts and minds and um, artists are in, are, in, are in the hearts and minds business. You'll use this, we're going to use this term just transition. It'll come up a lot. Um, it, it can mean many, many, many different things. Here, we really want to use it to talk about, and here's maybe a visual that'll help you. Uh, this is from Movement Generation from their um, description of, of just transition. But we really want to move from an extractive economy to a regenerative one. Um, and, the, and the key here is there's lots of different th ways, there's lots of different things to call what we are pushing for, uh, again, an economy that is caring, that, that values the sacred, that is, that is um, uh, that in sense that prioritizes ecological and social well-being, that is built on a deep democracy. Um, they use the term regenerative democracy, but I would say that what we're talking about here, solidarity economy, is basically the same thing, right? So we wanna, you know, in, in, in the simplest, most basic way of describing just transition, we wanna stop the bad and build the new, right? We wanna, we want to, Stop the, the bad stuff that they're doing, stop the extraction, stop the ecological destruction, stop the exploitation, the racial, gender, and, and, and other forms of inequality, and build a, a better economy, one that is regenerative, one that is built on solidarity uh, among ourselves and, and on right relationships with the earth. The term itself uh, was first popularized in Chile and France in the 1980s, but the practices, and this is you know, what I really like to emphasize, these, these are practices that are as old as human civilization. In many ways, all we're trying to do is remix indigenous economic traditions for the 21st century. Often when we talk about this stuff, people will say, you know, Francisco, this all sounds awesome, but this is stuff that my family or my community has been doing for eons. And, and that is exactly the point, right? It is in many ways a return to a different way of, of relating to each other and a different way of relating to the earth, but obviously in a very different uh, political, historical, social, cultural context. Um, but it is a global movement and an economic development framework that weaves together many strategies and aim to put people and planet ahead of profit. The core principle is community control of the economy, right, of our workplaces, of the land, of our financial institutions, and our government, rooted in participatory democracy, cooperation, solidarity, and respect for the earth. I like to boil it down to collective ownership and democratic management. So we own it and we run it, right? Again, those are older principles and those principles can take many, many forms and have taken many forms historically and take many forms today. But it's the same idea. We own it, we run it. I love this quote. This is from a, a colleague of ours, Dr. Stacey Sutton at the University of Chicago, who says the solidarity economy movement, again, is not new. It's not a new movement. It has historical roots in Latin America. In the United States, it builds off the legacy of the Black Liberation Movement. Um, there was, um, there's a long history of, of Black cooperatism in this country. So if you look um, down here to the right of this screen, you see the book Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemar, which is a history of the, of the ideas and practices of Black cooperativism here in the US. And you know, again, this, you can see solidarity economy principles already in action across many sectors of our economy and our society, right? So you can see them in land and housing, 
Uh, I myself grew up in the limited equity co-op. Um, there are community land trusts. There are resident-owned uh, communities. There, you know, there's we, there are many of us are familiar with grocery cooperatives and, and food and agriculture. Um, there are, um, you know, the, the library, right? If, if you want to think about it, the library is based on cooperative principles, right? Anyone can go and take out a book, and if more people want it, you don't necessarily pay more for that book. You just wait for it, right? So it's built. It's based on a very different principle than a bookstore, right? So we're going to focus on what this means for art and artists, but just know that this is part of a much larger ecosystem that encompasses really any sector of our economy um, can be cooperativized in some way or another, right? So you may already be practicing solidarity economy without knowing it, um, at least knowing it explicitly. So, you know, you've participated in mutual aid and time bank, and time bank for bartering, a meal swap or meal train, saving school, school pools, um, clothing swaps, nanny co-ops, book clubs, tool libraries, skill shares, buy nothing groups, recycling. These are all ex already existing examples of the solidarity economy. So I, we also love this quote from, from another one of our colleagues, Emily Kawano. We do not need to wait to quote unquote, wait for the revolution because solidarity economy practices already exist all around us today. Our task is to make these practices visible and to grow and connect them. Solidarity economy institutions include cooperatives, worker-owned, consumer or producers, public banks, community land trusts, alternative currencies, and high banks. Right. So we're already doing this. We've already we've done this for a long time. We do it now. The question is, um, how do we make this the dominant way that we relate to each other? Right. Right now, the dominant way we relate to each other is through money. Right. It's through kind of um, capitalist social relations, right? So how do we get away from having money be between us and, and, and recover and grow this, this other way of doing it? Uh, as Nadi mentioned, her and, and her partner, Carolyn Willard, put out a report on Solidarity Economy for the Arts, um, which has a bunch of, of examples and gets much more into detail about into everything that I'm discussing here today. So if you want to learn more, check them out at www.art.coop. And they put out, again, a very comprehensive list of, of, of artists um, and, and, and culture makers centered cooperative um, land trusts and other solidarity economy principles and institutions. So if you want to you know, look into what you know, um, different artists and, 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 and different um, cultural groups are doing throughout the country to implement this stuff, to put to, to, to breathe life into it, to make it a reality, uh, please check out the report. Again, this, this shows you, this gives you a very brief overview of what different experiments are in, in money and finance, land and housing, worker, work and labor, food and farming, right? And, and I would emphasize these, these are experiments, right? These are people trying new and different things. Um, so some of these, um, may have grown since we profiled them. Some of them may no longer exist, right? But it's, it's, they're all uh, uh, opportunities to learn and, and grow this new thing. And then finally, you know, like what, what can you do? So again, the goal is artist control, right? The goal of solidarity economy is for people to be self-governing, for them to own and, and run their own workplaces, for them to own and run their own residences, their own land for them to own and run their own financial institutions, to, to be their own bankers, and then for them to own and run their own government, right? So what, what does it mean to support artist control? And you know, what can you do uh, as an artist or someone who wants to support uh, artists to, to, to further this movement? The first thing is you can learn and unlearn, right? So there's been an explosion in artists, uh, consciousness raising groups, study groups, organizing groups, um, if you think about the Just Transition Framework, you, you can resist, right? So you can resist by, edit, by joining artist-led resistance campaigns, groups like Strike MoMA, the Union for, Muni for Musicians and Allied Workers, and many more. Again, please put your campaign to the chat. Um, we don't all know all the examples. Part of putting on these kind of events is for us to learn from each other about all the things that people are doing. There, there's been such an explosion that there's no way that any one group of people could keep up with all the different exciting new initiatives. Then in terms of build, you know, what we want to build is a world where um, artists 
uh, who work in groups are organized into cooperatives, right? Where they're not being exploited by various intermediaries like record labels or, or gallery owners, right? They, they own um, their own artistic production where artists get housing, right? Housing they can afford, housing that allows them to, to um, do their art, right? So, so community land trust for artists. Uh, participatory budgeting, we find that when, when um, it's up to, to ordinary citizens to decide what to do with their um, city or you know, with their local and state budget, they want to devote more to the arts um, and, to, and to community arts than, than their uh, legislatures or the bureaucrats that run these agencies would. Uh, and then we're going to need money, right? So democratic loan funds, participatory philanthropy, uh, cultural investment funds, etc. And this is a uh, a, a graphic we love to, to use from, from Carolyn, who you know, helps people envision what life as an artist in a solidarity economy could look like, right? So I don't have a boss, right? I'm a worker in a cooperative business. I don't have a landlord. I'm a member of a land trust, co-op, or intentional community. I don't pay for school. I participate in self-organized schools and demand free education. I don't hoard my stuff. I take part in tool shares, barter clubs, and clothing swaps. I don't buy food that kills. I'm a member of a food co-op, CSA, community garden. I don't let my bank profit up with me. I join a credit union so my money starts saving in the community. Um, if you want a shorter version, you can think of the t-shirt that uh, the New Economy Coalition uh, sells, which is fire the bosses, free the land, and elect ourselves, right? We can run our own workplaces. We can run our own uh, housing and and feed ourselves, and we can elect our. We should elect ourselves, right? And we can run our own government. We don't need uh, politicians make cutting deals for themselves, and and their donors in, in, in smoke filled rooms. So, you know, we live in a world where we're used to art as a business, right? Um, commodified art, art that is made to be sold, sold for profit. Uh, that's how most of us get our art. Many of us who produce art are, are caught in the same kind of nexus. We're used to philanthropy, right? So art as a grant, um, you know, as a charitable donation. Um, and we're, you know, to a certain extent, a much smaller extent, used to art as a kind of public service, um, art that's publicly funded. So, you know, part of what we're asking is what else can art be, right? What else, art is what, right? What would it mean for us to own and control our own art and our own culture? Right. What should be the role of an artist in a solidarity economy? Who would produce art? Who would consume it? And how would it be distributed? And now, uh, Nadia's going to talk to you about all the different networks that exist and how you can plug in. Well, quickly, because I have the baby here, but I just want to, well, we can share this with folks, but, you know, uh, everything that Francisco shared with you, there are ways that you can plug in their national networks doing this work. Um, there are sector-based networks as well. So if you're, you know, curious about learning more about worker co-ops um, or land work, you know, you, um, we'll share this with you all. Um, the New Economy Coalition puts out a, a, a newsletter every two weeks where we try to lift up a lot of the work of different members around the country. Um, so it definitely, if your first step is like, whoa, my mind is blown and I want to learn more, that would be a really good first step. Um, next slide. Uh, and then Dre from the New York Network of Worker Co-ops could probably talk more to this, but I wanted to give a little bit of a roadmap for NYC folks um, of some of the networks just in New York um, and campaigns that are going on related to solidarity economy. So you'll learn more about the New York Network of Worker Co-ops. I highlighted just two co-ops, for example, related to arts and culture. Well. <laughs> not directly, but Meerkat Media is a, a media co-op and then a new co-op that folks are excited about. It's a taxi rideshare cooperative. Um, it's an app, you know, don't use Lyft and Uber. You can use the driver's co-op. Um, and uh, this is another kind of longer list of other NYC initiatives, um, participatory budgeting, the community land initiative. So folks on this call who are, you know, who are gonna be speaking later can speak more to this, but just wanted to compile just you know what's going on in New York City in ways that you can plug in. That's it. And these are just some further resources as well. Um, in particular, I really want to highlight the role of study right now. I think 
Um, that's something that I'm seeing a lot more of. There's a group called Anti-Capitalism for Artists that's just an informal nine week study group that um, I think has been a really generative space for arts and culture bearers to like learn and unlearn and develop a class politics. So I just wanted to highlight that um, and we'll, we'll send these out to you all. That's it, I got a baby here. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco and Nati. That was um, so helpful. I think a lot of us might be somewhat familiar with some of these ideas. And like, you know, like you were saying, Francisco, you know, a lot of these ideas, right, aren't new. These are the ways that many of us have been living our lives or in some ways have been forced to kind of shift um, just because of the, the impact of, of living under, you know, neoliberal capitalism. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I think a lot of us are digesting um, some of it and, and I'm really excited that there are such, um, there's such a wealth of folks who are doing this work here locally and obviously across the world. Um, and, you know, we, we did want to highlight tonight um, some of those folks who are, are doing, you know, living the solidarity economy and, and pushing for this new economy. Um, and so up next, we do want to bring up uh, Memo Salazar from the Queens Community Land Trust. Um, so welcome, Memo. I think we'll drop your info in the chat so folks can know a little bit more about you. Um, sure. But we'll, uh, yeah, we'll pass it to you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is amazing and awesome. I did not know you guys existed and it's just like right up my alley. Um, I'm here representing the Land Trust, but I am also, I'm a filmmaker and a musician and a writer. And I mean, it's been arts has been part of my life my whole life. So, you know, this is right up everything I've always believed. Uh, and it's nice to see a movement based around this. Um, but today I'm here as um, the co-chair of the Western Queens Community Land Trust, which is a fairly new group. Um, we came after Amazon, the battle for Amazon and Amazon left. And a lot of us who didn't really know each other actually just sort of had all fused in this sort of battle here in Western Queens. And we, um, where we're asking ourselves what's going to happen to that giant building that Cuomo was going to give away uh, to Amazon that's like a large public building and so we started talking and and you know brainstorming basically and um, you know we all kind of had lots of different ideas but the sort of solidarity was this should be a community space for artists and uh, immigrant workers and light manufacturing uh, and so on and so we realized that um, a land, a community land trust, which none of us really knew much about, was seemed to be the way to go. And so we invited uh, some uh, some friends and comrades from other land trusts, like uh, in up in South Bronx Unite, and so on. And they came down and spoke to us and sort of told us what they had gone through and sort of laid the groundwork. And we had some uh, great academic advisors come and like join and help. And it all sort of kind of fused together really nicely. I've never really had such a nice experience with a group of people I'd never met. It's been very, like the chemistry has been really perfect. And um, so, you know, then COVID hit. And so everything got kind of crazy, but now we're kind of coming out of that. And so we have this building that we now got a grant for um, to study, make a feasibility study. And let me, um, let me show you, can you guys see that? Um, so this is the Department of Education building on Vernon Boulevard. Um, you can see right over here on the right side is Queensboro Bridge, and right next to that is Queensbridge Housing, um, and real literally to the left of the building is like all the luxury towers of LIC Waterfront. So this building is right in the middle of literally like the rich and the poor, um, and it's just sitting there. It, the, the Department of Ed is using it, but they're not using much of it. It's like 700,000 square feet of this, of this building, and a lot of it is just kind of storage, just like a big closet, and so we are hoping to work with them, that's our hope that they will sort of be allies in this, to see how we can redistribute this space for um, artists and all sorts of things. We're thinking of um, a, a rooftop farm at the top, a commissary kitchen for pushcart vendors, a food co-op, lots of art and music studios, uh, theaters, you know, like shared community theaters that people can rent out or not rent out, but like check out and so on. Um, maybe a school. Also, this is just like an old visioning image just to, when we started it off. And this has evolved a little bit. Um, but just to give you a sense of where it is, here's a waterfront. And this is Annabelle Basin. Um, 
and this is the Department of Ed building. So this is what we're talking about. And if I switch over to this, so we got a, um, a grant and this year we're, we're working with an architect named Nandini Bagshi, who's awesome and amazing and very much, uh, you know, on the side of, of the people and, you know, like her heart's in the right place. And she's also a great architect. Um, and she's work she's basically going to design she's we're having lots of community meetings and talking to different groups we had we had an arts one some of you may have been on that arts one actually um and but we're still trying to get input from people like what do you need how much space would you need what what are your needs as as uh in different groups artists is just one of the categories but i just wanted to show you quickly um this is her very preliminary drawing so this is not in any way um final but just she started um so in the bottom floor we have like a push cart garage and a commissary kitchen and then a co-op food market but then when we go upstairs all these workshop spaces are like communal spaces artist studios is her idea um where people can have their space you know and uh, we're hoping for like music studios for for kids of queensbridge who want to like record music and, and all sorts of things um all the way up to the top floor. Um, and again, this is already preliminary. We may not be able to do a school, but we are, there is people want really want a school. So we've basically been talking to the community and like, what is the most, what is it that you need? And we've tried to fit all of that in this sort of ideal fantasy visioning of the building. Um, and then we'll see, you know, this is gonna evolve. Um, uh, and I, I'm going fast just so that you guys can kind of get a very brief overview. I'm happy to get into the weeds on this um, with anybody who's interested. Um, but uh, the bottom line is this building is like, there's not a lot of, there's nothing like this in the city actually in terms of this size and scope. It's a huge building and it's, you know, it's a public building. And so um, everybody should have, everyone, especially, you know, this is for Western Queens specifically, but it is a space for all of us to be able to share. Um, we're working with a lot of worker co-ops as well, um, who would be using some of those workshops and so on. Um, and the street vendor project for the Pushcart Garage and all sorts of different wonderful people um, are, are part of this. But if anyone is interested in this, either because they need space or just to get more involved in this push, you know, we are open and happy to have folks uh we always need help we're you know this is a huge community project and we're just starting out um and there's a lot of um you know there's just a lot of needs and, and a lot of work but in terms of the clt just to ex explain what a community land trust is because it's probably a little vague um since we all live in this capitalist system where land is a commodity and uh we're far from the sort of utopian vision where we're all sort of truly sharing in the land. A CLT is sort of a way for the people to reclaim land in within the legal framework of the capitalist system that we live in. So in other words, a CLT is a nonprofit and it can own land. And usually what happens is that as a CLT acquires land, they this is a little bit of a weird explanation, but like the CLT doesn't own the building that is on the land. They they hold the deed to the land and the building might be a privately owned if it's like a house or it might be a public building like this or it might be, there, you know, whoever owns a building, they're entering into a contract with a CLT who owns the deed to the land and the CLT basically represents the people. So the CLT is made up of a tripartite board of people from the community. Um, and the idea is that a third of that board are people who live or work in that building. So in this case, like if we're talking about the DOE building, a third of that board would be actual artists and other people that are working and have their businesses or their studios in that building, but only a third. And that's because, well, let me, so the other third is, would be like people from the community, people from Western Queens who understand the needs of the community and understand the building and have input and are affected by, but don't actually live or work there and then the other third are people like academic advisors experts who understand the issues that the land trust has to deal with but aren't don't have a personal stake in that in that property and so the reason it's divided like that is like a checks and balances system so that for example a lot of um affordable housing was given to the city you know decades and decades ago uh and the people that lived in those buildings decided they would just flip it to market rate and make a lot of money and there was no real structure to stop them from doing that if the entire building voted hey we're just going to flip this it's gone the affordability clause was gone so this system is to prevent that and so you have this 99 year lease 
and you have a board that is going to that is never going to have more than a third majority. So if the people that are in there all voted to, to flip it, that's only 33 percent. It's not enough to, to change the, the laws. And that's why we have that system. Um, and anyone can join. You know, this is an open an open thing. And it's and it's really as again, it's sort of like, how do you make this kind of thing work within like this very capitalist system where every square foot is a ton of money? Um, and so a CLT is very attractive for, for New York City. Obviously, the hard part is how do you pay for this and how do you how do you buy land? In this case, we wouldn't buy the land because it's public, but even so, the cost of renovations, the cost of maintenance, um, how do you do that? And so that's we've been exploring that too. That's another side that we're exploring with experts. And we've had some preliminary reports to explain the the the, the uh, cost analysis of that as well. Um, but it's going to be a slow process. I mean, this is a conversation with the city. Um, you know, I mean, the fear is that the city that another governor or mayor might just decide to give this to Google or Facebook or some other giant corporate entity. And so we're trying to sort of prevent that by stepping in and saying we have an alternate plan that can bring economic value to the neighborhood. It can bring jobs, all the things that politicians love to throw around, but in a real sense, right? Because these would be all worker controlled and worker owned uh, businesses. It wouldn't be, um, you know, a giant corporation promising jobs. Um, and so, yeah, that's like the really fast, short version. So uh, the CLT exists for Western Queens. It's not just about this building. We're, we're interested in housing. We're interested if, if any of you, for example, knew of a, of a derelict building uh, that you thought, you know, this would be a great studio space and I don't know how to make that happen. We would be there to tr try to figure that out with you. You know, you, um, whether it's somebody owns it or whether the city it's like, or whether it was like foreclosure you know, or abandoned. There's all these different avenues of, of how we might be able to acquire that. And we're new, so we're learning as we go. You know, we're not experts, but there are many people who are experts. And so we've been listening and learning from them. Uh, uh, brothers in Oakland who have been doing the CLT in Oakland, who've been doing this for a while and, and they're amazing. And they've managed to get a lot of properties and help a lot of people that way. And so that's kind of where we're, where we're headed. But um, again, everyone is completely invited and welcome. And I'm happy to answer any questions if people have questions and so on. Remo, uh, I, I don't know if you're, you, uh, you're going to have to jump, right? Or are you going to stay? Yeah, I, I can stay a little bit longer, but I do have to jump. Okay. So the first thing I think maybe uh, people asked uh, if you could have a contact uh, info or somewhere where they can get in touch with you to, to join in or support or um, yeah, I'll put write that in the chat maybe. Yeah, I will write that in that right now. Yeah, please, anyone is happy to, I'm happy to have anyone. And then since there are people in the room, if and, and Memo's got to jump, if anybody has a, a quick a question in mind right now, maybe we can take that and then do the collective question for everybody else who has time to stay on before we turn to, uh, to Centro. Yes, and you can always also write to Momo Divest and uh, We'll also be able to connect you. Antonio's put that in the chat. There's memos. Yeah, if, if folks have questions, definitely drop them in the chat. I, you know, I wonder, Memo, if you could talk a little bit. I mean, if we're thinking about Western Queens, and obviously, I think all of us were part of, in some ways, the Amazon fight. Um, but, you know, institutions like MoMA, obviously, PS1 is a, you know, has lots of land in Western Queens. And I wonder, you could speak to a little bit about the ways that the, the land trust, um, you know, could be resisting uh, land grabs by institutions or the way that I think PS1 is, is implicated in a lot of these. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, one, when we had, first of all, when we had the uh, meeting with artists, I asked the question, I mean, I knew what I believed, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Like, do you want, someone like MoMA or PS1 to be like a, a staple tenant in this building, you know, and everyone was like unequivocally no. So, so it was like, okay, so, so, you know, part of it is like, that's by excluding them is already a, an action, right? It's not, it's that we're making a, a statement by saying, this is not what this is. This is something else. Um, uh, we're not like, it's not like there's been any reason for us to sort of take MoMA head on or anything like that. Um, but I think offering an alternative method of art space is already just, I don't know, they, they would perceive it as a threat, but it's definitely threatening the sort of perceived way of how an artist is supposed to work. Um, and so again, like because we're small, it's not like we have like 20 different projects going on. This has kind of taken up all our resources, but 
um, if, if anyone here, if a collective was like, you know what, we've got this project, but we didn't know how you even start, you know, that, that would require land or a building, you know, that's what we're there for. Like, we're basically like the vessel, the umbrella for the community to be able to start taking land off the market and, and back into the hands of the people. Um, it, I mean, you know, like, so for example, one, one group we are speaking to who I think, um, uh, by the way, Jenny Dubna is a painter who is, um, I think she, I thought I saw her on this call. She's actually the, the co-chair with me. Um, and so she's also very much her, she's an artist and her, you know, her passion is the arts as well. And we are, have been talking to the folks from Five Points who very symbolically like are the spirit and soul of LIC. Um, and so we want them in this building, we want them to, you know, we both would love to see this building painted the way uh, Five Points was painted from the outside and the entire sort of like rebirth of that sort of soul is happening in this building. Um, and so uh, they, they're definitely interested and they're definitely wanting to be a partner in this and, you know, with the studios and so on. Um, but I think they're really important because they, you know, they were there first, they were like, laid the groundwork for that area they fought for that area and so they deserve to sort of be recognized in that in that sense and so i think in terms of um i don't know if the five point settlements but if they wanted to give it to you know they might and no one's ever even we haven't asked or they've never mentioned that but you know obviously if they're like listen here's 500 grand we'd be like yes we can easily put this money to good use so we'll we'll, we'll see but um, who, I don't even know when they're going to get that money anyway, you know, I think it's probably a slow process, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, that would kind of be like fitting, right, that like the money that came from a settlement from someone who took their space goes back into like a greater building than they had ever met, you know, I mean, so, so however we can, however we can make that happen, I mean, there is a lot of, this is going to be a, a definitely a political battle, um, uh, one way or another. We don't want it to be a contentious one, but it is definitely going to be political because it's a big building. And I'm sure there are already right now lots of groups that are eyeing it and want it, you know, from a corporate point of view, making deals with the city, talking to whoever the mayor is going to be, the new mayor, all sorts of things. So like at some point, it's going to take like the voice of the community to be really loud to show that like if you were to not honor this project and instead give it to a, a corporate entity like there will be held a bit like this, not 10 people complaining. It's like an entire uh, community. And I think the fact that this building isn't just an artist space, but is truly a cross culture of food justice and, you know, health and wellness and, and all sorts of different things, I think really truly reflects that it's not just like one slice of the pie. It's like everyone can really benefit from this. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's sort of uh yeah, that's so yeah. But I mean, it was a good big answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Capacious answer. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's a lot of questions that everybody could ask. I mean, I have questions about, you know, money, for example. You just touched on it. But I think maybe in the interest of time, maybe we can collect those at the end and 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 um, and, and maybe bug you outside and send it to everybody um, separately. So if people have questions about um community land trust in general or, or or the queen's version and memo and other people's projects here uh, i'll i can you know one thing i'll just throw yeah. in because people are asking about different questions about zoning and, and building and so on yeah so one side fight that we've been battling or working with a whole coalition of groups around the city is about the tax lien sale um and if you haven't heard of that it's a horrible predatory system controlled by a private group of investors basically the city gave it to them to control in the 90s um, and uh, we're trying to take it back and part of that would be that that we'd be working with people that are falling behind on payments but eventually if the houses did go into foreclosure that CLTs and, and other mission driven groups would get the first right now the first dip is like a you know it's a sale and it goes right to a bunch of developers who are like on this secret list that no one else can jump on so they get to buy all these buildings really cheap and it doesn't even it's not even a public sale it's like literally just like a closed thing so this would flip that in and take those buildings and bring it back to the community so it's a it's an opportunity if that goes through and we were able to get city council to freeze it and this is a year that they're rethinking how it's going to be and um, i mean it seems good that they are going to change the system so that is an opportunity for artists 
for you know derelict buildings all over the city that are um, just kind of sitting there that have been in limbo that would normally what would happen would be the trust would hold on to them wait for the neighborhood to get gentrified and then sell them to a developer in a tax lien sale uh, and everybody makes money um, this you know that wouldn't stop and we would have these buildings and we would find financing ways um, there's also a movement for a public bank which would go hand in hand with this um, if you've heard of that so there's a lot of different groups doing a lot of different things and I th this is a perfect synergy of that like what you guys are doing from the arts point of view and it's exciting because if all these things kind of achieve a critical mass it's like a whole different way of running the city um, which excites me and i'm sure everyone here so um but yeah yeah well what what you guys are doing more than what we guys are doing but hopefully you're right that this this is a place where some of that synergy can can happen so thank you uh memo for for the time and all the work um again the um emails contact infos in the chat for those who don't have it will sit will you can get in touch with us this is this is great we're going to turn to centro um corona uh, also queens who are uh, also amazing folks who who actually did what what we're saying I mean, the transition happened they were part of um they can they can introduce themselves and give the detail but but for me uh, having worked a little bit um, with them, is, you know, the, the movement out of what was actually created through the city and, uh, you know, the big art setting, right? It was created by a big name artist and so on. But they, they themselves, the community pulled themselves out of that situation and continued it as their own center, um, horizontally led and very, very thoughtful and reflexive. So Adrienne and uh, Milton, are here to uh, to show us how that's done. Hey everyone, uh, Milton here. He him. Um, I'll start, um, and uh, I think Adrian then will follow up on what I say. So I think I'll just provide some context on what Centro is and where we came from. Um, yes, great. Uh, so Centro is an intergenerational community uh, center. We're in Corona. Uh, 104th, 05th, and 47th Ave. Uh, we have built from experience, leadership, and knowledge of working class and neighboring uh, communities from Corona and other neighborhoods in Queens. And uh, we're striving to build a self-determined, collectively imagined future. Uh, we officially formed in 2018, but have a, as I will say, like a longer history that reaches back to 2011. Um, and basically we organized around intersections of uh, responding to violences that are local and global. Uh, those type of like violent processes of destabilization uh, and with collective creativity, solidarity and strength. Um, that's like a very wide way of like saying what we do, <laughs> but we have a lot of like the different little things. Um, so just to give you some context, so it, Centro was first named uh, um, Imi Corona, um, you know, and it was started as a project by a uh, big name artist, uh, Tiana Bruguera, with uh, the support of the Queens Museum and a grant um, from Creative Time. Uh, and it had two, basically two principal ways of looking at it from the two points of view, right? From the artist and from the museum. One, the museum perspective was really like to bring programming accessibility to culture, um, in a new space in, in an immigrant community, right? Uh, like a storefront for that type of thing and build a relationship with the community. Like the museum, the Queens Museum had always felt like you needed more of a relationship with the community. And from the artist's perspective, what I know, I never met this artist, right? But from what I know um, is uh, they uh, really try, we're trying to test museums as uh, civic institutions uh, and to also perform uh, social activism as art. And I very careful in choosing those words like perform social activism, right? Uh, it was never really necessarily about organizing. Um, so two things really quickly from that is that the idea of museums, uh, broad, more broadly speaking, uh, or also, you know, the way they engage communities or anything like their surroundings uh, and the, even the way that they're appraised, right, is that museums bring culture to a space, right? They, they create what you would name a cultural space, a cultural district, right? So even from the get-go, you already have this tension 
that, um, you know, um, a museum is bringing culture to a space to like immigrant communities where immigrant communities were actually providing the culture and the museum ended up like actually extracting all this culture, um, you know? Um, and the way that this happened is basically that uh, a lot of, uh, there were a lot of collectives that were, um, you know, were basically using the space, the storefront space that was created for one purpose. And um, from 2011 to 2013, it was like basically different collectives were finding their space. And I think in 2013, there were conversations that were actually through allies from like museum staff and people who have been there since the beginning trying to push for more collectivism in the space. There was an ask to actually have some community, community leadership about um, not the resources, because you couldn't, the museum is the one who like basically said what the resources are, uh, but at least what the direction of like the themes or the subject matter of the education that happened at Imi Corona um, were happening, right? And then this kept being a push, you know, community kept on pushing these things little by little. Um, Adrian, if you could give me like two extra minutes after that. <laughs> um, so what happened then is, um, there were that there were different pushes then like community councils created uh and uh we um by the time that i stepped in which is around 2015 2016 uh there are already processes in which there are conflicts between like what artists and local people want to do as far as like meeting the needs of the community versus what um you know um, a museum might want to like show right um um, so once we started having, you know, the, the, the museum has its own staff and its own things, and they were trying to have conversations, um, you know, community push for conversations about this. We started like a, our own investigation of like histories of other collectives. And here we're talking about collectives that exist today, right? In spaces, like we're talking about Mayday space, for example, but also other spaces that had existed before, like Evicino Rio, or also spaces in other, uh, not in New York, like the like, tenants union. And we were talking about like people that we knew in each of these spaces or who held some of these histories and that we wanted to learn more of, uh, more of, not for the sense of necessarily like controlling a space particularly, but actually really to do what the community needed to do, which was actually organized, right? And cultural organizing at the center of that. Um, during this process of learning, uh, we, there was a huge land sale um, and we basically were told that we needed to, um, the landlord wouldn't even speak to the people who used IMI, like they spoke to the museum and then the museum had to tell us, right? We don't even know how long they held that information, but we were told that we needed to leave by the end of the month. So there was like a displacement that happened uh, through like a huge land sale. Um, and basically a group of people, you know, within the community also again, um, met to, um, you know, respond to this, to like another destabilization. Uh, and um, through the questionings that were happening from looking at other collectives, we were already investigating this idea of like, what, what does it mean even to be, why are we part of this museum? You know, what are the limitations within this? You know, we keep on, um, the museum keeps on being a, a structure that is serves as a platform for individuals or for even like an art collective that grants a lot of visibility, right? Um, but we also see the museum has, you know, all the cultural work that has been going on for years collectively is basically created this whole capital from which a museum actually stands on like a, as its own tradition, right? Like, a, as a, you know, they, very specifically, for example, we've got great rant, grants about their community efforts that have a lot to do with the work that Imi was doing, right? I mean, every institution does this, right? But we have no idea how those things are written. Uh, so that's like one of those examples. So we're talking and we're not even able to say where that money goes, where does it come from? We can't even see those things. We couldn't even look, you know, we couldn't even respond to our own displacement directly with the people who were displacing us. So, you know, the question came to a head of like, okay, we need to actually um, split from, from the museum. And we split from the museum, we find our own space. Uh, what that took, you know, um, a lot of relationships were interrupted. I mean, that's what displacement does, you know, when we're talking about displacement, then like we, we think about it as a, as a land issue, but also as relationships, right? It's relational. 
uh, you know, you basically are disrupting all these relationships and networks, and then they have to scramble and then like come together again, right? So there was a lot of disruption that happened around there. And also, um, you know, some people also who necessarily saw the museum as that platform that they wanted to pursue that, you know, might not want to be in a relationship of more collectivism. So, you know, people also chose their sides. And now, since then, we have been working to sustain ourselves. That's a very quick, uh, you know, overview of things. And I want to pass it to Adrian to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, um, the structure and then we can talk about the differences. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how Centro is structured right now. Um, so like Milton mentioned, Centro is a volunteer led community center organization um, with one part time coordination staff member and Basically, the rest of Centro's members are volunteers who the general structure is that Centro is like composed of multiple autonomous committees and how that functions is that committees make decisions about their own sort of like realms of work and then uh, currently an in, like an interim coordination team holds community meetings for decisions that need to be made like more community wide um, also makes like day to day decisions and in the process is that this coordination team will also coordinate the formation of a new evolution of leadership and this leadership might be you know a single body or it might not be that's like to be decided um, and also connected to those committees are various collectives, working groups, partner organizations, also members, families, and, and neighbors. Um, and that's like sort of how Central is structured today. Um, in terms of like how Central connects to nonprofits, there's no single decision making groups, there's no executive director. Um, there is a four person four, but the leadership lies with committees. Um, and uh, Centro is also fiscally sponsored. So there's also that connection to like the nonprofit industrial complex. Centro is fiscally sponsored by an organization that has been in coalition with Centro through Hate Free Zone Queens. Um, Desi's rising up and moving drum since 2017. Um, so they sort of have like the nonprofit certification and central also is connected to that. Um, and basically since since Amy's displacement in 2018, um, people at Central formed multiple committees. So that includes the Kira Solicito Post or Sunflowers and Moles committee and this is a group of people who strategize ways for us as an organization and community to navigate the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, I am part of this committee. I joined Centro in 2017 and then um, joined GNT, um, the Sunflowers and Wolves committee the year after in 2018. So like we're going to talk about it a little bit later but that sort of like the process of me joining that group is also when I personally felt a closer relationship to Centro and like a bigger like sense of responsibility to Centro too. And I think that is connected to how Centro as an independent organization can like make different types of decisions. Um, and um, let's see, so now, sort of connected to what Milton was talking about before, people who are directly connected to organizing now are also the same people who write the narratives about it and do so collectively. Um, and another big part of what Centro has been doing for the past year is that in March 2020, Centro partnered with Queens Neighborhoods United and Project Hajra to form a mutual aid network um, that connects about a thousand people throughout Queens in different types of support. So with food deliveries, cash assistance, 
political education, death and grief support, telemedicine, teletherapy, phone banking, virtual hangouts. Um, and that's still ongoing. And the longer term plans and discussions for Centro as a community and organization are also taking place like simultaneously. So that's sort of how Centro, that's like um, how Centro is structured now. So now I guess we'll turn, we can talk about like future plans and also differences between the different organizational structures. Yeah, so I think like now hearing a little bit about, um, well, let me just put a little timer here so we don't have the, because otherwise we could talk forever about. <laughs> um, so we're talking about like, oh, and just shout out, like, you know, there's Maria in the chat. Um, just to say that there are people like, you know, Centro folk right now in the audience who, if they ever wanna add anything about like their own experiences, cause people, different people carry different like histories around what happened during these processes of, uh, you know, when I talk about a process of like collectivizing or communalizing things and it's still ongoing, right? There's also like violence is tied to those things, right? And, uh, you know, um, I don't know if like a lot of people have experiences with having worked there in, like inside an arts institution or a nonprofit, that was like, you know, there's like violence is connected to those things, right? And how you're treated as a staff or like what you're being asked to hold. Um, I think one of the things that we can uh, say that the structure that we have today has allowed is uh, basically that, um, you know, all these contradictions that we're talking about uh, when it comes to capitalism or it comes to like distract this distraction of cultural work right uh, the contradictions are held not by a collective but they're you know within the museum structure they're held by the museum and the only way that they're actually dealt with is for profit of the institution right um, you know they're not necessarily like you know dispelled or like dealt with in other ways right like I have seen uh, to like before the pandemia, even to the last year before the pandemia, I, I still saw this artist whom I never met, by the way, having been there for so many years, who was not, not, not present, still going to panels to talk about, you know, and these panels are paid, you know, like international panels with big, other big name artists to talk about this work, right? So this is like how also cultural capital is formed, right? And those, intro, intro, those contradictions are also just dealt by them in the way that it serves them, you know? Now those contradictions doesn't mean that they have completely gone, right? Because we're still doing the system, we still pay rent, we still do those things, but these contradictions are a conversation amongst ourselves now. Uh, and I think that's one of the big differences, uh, you know, when we talk about how we're dealing with sustaining ourselves, right? Uh, and how we can envision futures. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if also you want to talk about how, like, becoming an independent organization also allows for, like, different types of relationships. I'm saying this because Milton and I just talked about this literally before this call. Yeah, we, it's kind of, you know, it sounded so great when we talk. I mean, it still sounds great, <laughs> but we prep. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it is, again, you know, we could go back to like relational, you know, like what extractive relationships versus other type of relationships, right? Uh, sorry, Adrian, I don't know if you had anything else to say actually for this. Mm. Um, and that's, okay, so that's with everything, right? Like between people, between even spaces, um, you know, to, one example that we were talking about, I hope this actually ties in, but one quick example that we were talking about before with Adrian was like the use of public space, right? So like within the structure of a museum, you know, we also had like all this cultural organizing that came from people, you know, that's actually some amazing stuff has happened throughout the years. Stuff that has been pushed by so many different people really trying to push for like community organizing and communal identities, right? So we had like a day of the death celebration, other types of celebrations, and they were held resource based by, this, by, by the museum, right? Which by the way, considered Imi Corona a program. That's how they 
um, you know, they source resourced us. It was a program of theirs, you know, um, not necessarily like a community, right? It's, it's, it's very different. Um, so anyway, when they take over a, a public space, when you're thinking about an institution, like there are permits or like police that they talk to, there's like all these little things that make some of that possible and the infrastructure is there for community to use, which was great. But the thing that that does is that that creates this relationship to the space where the only inter intermediary to use it is a museum or an institution like that. And that kind of like makes it the only official way to use a public space. Once we were this, we, we stopped doing this, stopped being with the museum, we really started um, using public space just to use it. You know, we had a caserorazo, we had like, you know, we, we held it as like a political space, right? Um, so that's like a relationship to space that changed and it, it felt like it was an illusion before, right? Oh, we don't need to do all these other things, right? Of course, there are risks with how we use in public space now, but you know, but we have a relational infrastructure. We have our own sense of security. We got our own sense of like what it means to call a cultural event, right? And that takes a lot of work, but you know, um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the examples. Um, um, I don't know if Adrian wants to add something quick to that. Um, I mean, I think the only, like the only other thing that I think was that we were talking about before was that like separating from the museum wasn't necessarily us transitioning out of like the nonprofit industrial complex entirely. So like I said, like we still are fiscally sponsored and also, um, part of our operating budget does rely on grants too. Um, and eventually we do like, we do want Centro to be fully grassroots funded with no reliance on grant funding. So with our general operations covered and part of our like future dreaming is to buy the building to be able to lessen the threat of another displacement and also be able to plan for longer and further and deeper in the neighborhood and community that Centro has been in for years now. Um, and that's like really the only, yeah, I think that's the last thing yeah. we were talking about. Yeah, so if people wanna support that, let us know. <laughs> yes, yes, drop the link, become a sustainer of El Centro and, well, Centro Corona, not to be confused with an effort yeah. from Centro actually. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much, Milton, Adrian. This was super helpful. And I think sort of getting into this piece around contradictions and sort of like recognizing that there are these tensions and contradictions that come up within the transition and like whether that's around funding, um, obviously around relationships. And I think, um, you know, just going back to what Francisco was saying in the beginning around like how how we own it, how we we run it, and um, that that is a different social relationship than we are sometimes able to create. Um, and so, having spaces like Centro Corona um, is is showing us that we can recreate those re relationships, um, and we can tackle some of these contradictions. And it's actually like a, a really great transition um, to our last but not least, certainly not least. Um, panelist, um, which is going to be Dre joining us from the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, um, not to put, again, people into corners, they have many different hats and things. Um, but I know uh, Dre it, it can speak a lot to some of these contradictions and, um, and, and talking also more about how, how some of these relationships get reimagined um, within frame, you know, frameworks like cooperatives. Um, so with that, we can, I feel like I'm bringing people to a stage, but we can bring up Dre um, and uh, we will have questions um, after this. So if you all have questions for Milton or Adrian um, or, or for Francisco, uh, definitely um, save them because we will hopefully have some time at the end. And yes, we will also drop the link to donate to, to Centro Corona. So, so please, if you're able to do that, um, we, we would appreciate it. Beautiful. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dre. Glad to be here. As a heads up, my internet is very shaky, so there is a chance I might just disappear. Um, 
but I'm glad to be tuning in with all of you. Um, I'm here very humbly um, speaking on the work of New York City Network for Worker Co-ops, a network of co-ops um, that definitely center um, frontline BIPOC workers um, with the majority immigrant workers, majority in domestic and cleaning um, services. Um, but before I dive in, um, yay, hey, Milton, I love the Centro. Um, before diving in, um, I'm curious if people want to put in uh, one in the chat box if you know what worker co-ops are, and two if you have no idea, maybe you have an idea, and I, but you're not totally sure and could use a definition. I would just love a temperature check. Um, You see some ones. Definition, please. Okay, cool. I have a little um, slideshow I would like to share. Um, let's see. Okay, here we are. Okay, so. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the New York City Network for Worker Co-ops. Um, New York City is home to so many co-op organizations. Um, let me share the screen. Um, I think what our work does more particularly is, um, let me, one second. Um, has a focus on policy as a trade association um, that can speak on a policy at a citywide level on behalf of all of our members. Um, we're a member-led organization with about um, 58 members, um, so therefore representing over 2,000 um, worker owners. Um, worker owners are what we call members of worker co-ops. And so what are worker co-ops? Um, people might be familiar with like, oh, the bougie food co-op, um, that might be like the most familiar thing we grab for. Um, that co-op, um, they're not always bougie. There's a really beautiful black um, lead food co-op that's coming soon into fruition, um, Central Brook, um, Brooklyn Food Co-op. But those examples of like grocery stores, um, that is a consumer co-op. So that's like the customers um, owning the enterprise and buying together um, and owning a part of that. Um, there's also marketing co-ops. Um, this is more popular with like farmers, um, folks in agriculture who might have their like own way of doing daily operations, um, different farmers, um, but they all like put in the fruits of their labor together under this shared, same shared marketing umbrella. So um, all under one brand logo. And um, where I'm coming from, the sector that I'm going to only speak on, because there's so many different sectors, um, is on worker co-ops. So that's the folks, the workers who are producing um, the actual uh, service together um, and producing um, the wealth that's being generated, and they're getting to share that. Um, so what are worker co-ops again? Um, they are democratic businesses. They definitely are businesses, but what makes them unique is that um, they're equally owned by their workers. Um, by that, the workers share the risks and share the reward. Um, there's lots of research that applaud worker co-ops um, as um, enterprises that can keep our economies more resilient in the long haul. Um, that sounds abstract, but on the day-to-day, by building enterprises and businesses where workers have um, an equal share. That means they have a unique stake um, and therefore incentives to keep um, the business at its best. And also um, with that incentive, the business is set up so that like folks don't want to let going to be retained. So especially now when we see um, so many businesses retained in their communities. Um, Co-ops aren't um, charity. Um, they're definitely about solidarity and self-help um, and about bringing in abundance for community and bringing community control. Um, there's a bunch more here, but um, you can feel free to Google that for more inspo. Um, 
I'll leave it here. Um, I was referring to this earlier, but based on work um, and mutual investment that each owner, um, worker owner um, has rights and responsibilities as worker owners, um, as well as shared risks. Um, have being an owner and entitled to one owner, one vote, um, there you have also a choice um, and a say in how pay is given. Um, doesn't necessarily mean equal pay, um, but there is um, structures that you can put into place for fair practices and fair ratios. Um, but I wanna emphasize there's not one size fits all to co-ops. Um, this is a statistic here. Um, and more focused on the US. Um, generally, we see um, businesses be a lot more sustainable um, and have more a lot resiliency on um, 25% um, for businesses that are six to 10 years. Um, and those that are uh, 26 years and older are having retention, 14% um, still um, being in operation, having that retention. Um, and so worker co-ops overall um, has definitely been, um, I would say, a media darling co-ops lately, um, the solidarity economy and, um, and rightfully so um, to some degree, I would say um, it is an enterprise that is more accessible to um, poor and working class people. Um, you know, it's hard to, it takes money to, you know, get money in this world that we live, we live in. So to be able to share the costs, um, it makes it more accessible for first time entrepreneurs. Um, also, um, definitely in New York City, um, our movement is powered by a base of at least 70% immigrant folks. Um, majority of whom I would say are Latinx, but it's not just Latinx too. Plenty of folks from um, Bang Bangladesh, um, also Korea, um, also the Caribbean represent. So don't wanna erase those folks too. Um, but overall, worker co-ops have been a really great um, entryway for um, uh, undocumented folks to exercise autonomy in the workplace um, because we live in a world where it's technically illegal to hire undocumented folks. However, there are loopholes that actually um, make it more feasible for undocumented folks to um, be a business owner. And so being in like an LLC entity, um, there, there have been loopholes. So um, our movement is definitely centering those folks. Um, and yeah, besides it being accessible because you know we get to share um, capital costs um, and share labor in that way, um, it is a business that is values driven. And so um, it is um, a model that um, is about um, building community and being in service to community. Um, it is a model that um, tries to live out everyday democracy in the workplace. Um, and uh, it has a value of like um, believing that we can call in prosperity and abundance for our labor. Um, so th that's kind of like a snapshot, but the more formal principles that technically um, are like the principles that um, co-ops are guided by are these, and these are international principles that were like identified in the 90s. Um, volunteer and open membership, democratic member control, um, economic participation, autonomy and independence, um, education, training and information, cooperation among cooperatives and concern for community. Um, that's a mouthful, but for, for this, for our movement, these pieces of um, this, these principles have been a really good, um, I would say useful tool to guide our values um, because just because you're a co-op doesn't, and just because you like share, um, you have a business partner doesn't mean necessarily you're living out cooperative values. You know, co-ops can definitely displace people. Co-ops can definitely, you know, um, not, can be extractive. Um, so that's why it's important for there to be guiding principles um, that um, guide our movement um, and. Um, I know we're spe I'm spe there's a wide range of folks tuning in um, and there's many like sectors that are at the site of a museum. Um, but I'm curious, like um, 
of the imaginations that you're like putting out in the constellations? Like what are your like principles that you want to rock with for your sector that you want to um, work on? So say you're like an educator in the museum or say you're like a sanitation worker in this museum. Like what are your principles for how you want to organize autonomy? That's my dog teacher, my apologies. Um, so I'll leave that there. Um, one thing that I will say, pivoting to New York City, um, working from home life. Okay. Um, so one thing to highlight about New York City um, that's really beautiful is that um, New York City is actually um, the city with the most uh, worker co-ops. Um, though it might be head to head with Oakland, um, but that a lot of it is thanks to um, a win we had. It's a really significant win um, for getting investment from, from the state toward worker cooperatives. So if we think about, um, you know, not just divest, but investment and conversations of investment, we, we got that win of getting that commitment to the city to invest in um, democratic workplaces. Um, so that started in 2014 with the win of uh, 1.2 million, and now we have uh, secured uh, about 5 million. Um, and uh, there are contradictions here, you know, um, they go to nonprofits. Uh, they, uh, it's very precarious money that only gets secured right now during budget season in the hands of city council members. So that's like leaves you know, a whole movement suspended at like 5 million every year repeatedly, but it is a win. It is, um, it, it, it is something that has been the seed. That win has been the seed, I would say, that has enabled a lot of co-ops and particularly frontline co-ops um, to be able to um, take shape um, and take root and to grow and build more autonomy for themselves and their families. Um, and so I'm back to Nick Knock. Um, again, we're a member led organization for worker co-ops. Um, there are so many more not listed here, but just wanted to offer some visual of um, how much there, how many co-ops there are in per borough. Um, since we are in the business of, oh, I'm so sorry. One second. Since we are in the topic of um, talking about artists and um, uh, and workers, um, I wanted to uplift some of our members who I think um, do really great um, services in the arts um, in service to the wider cooperative movement. And so there's Partners in Partners. Um, that's a really dope design worker co-op. Um, they do a lot of marketing and web design, um, including the right now they're working on the website for interference archives, which probably we all know. Um, but that's like an example of like cooperation amongst cooperatives. So how can we build and support our, our solidarity economy by moving our money with to each other, invest each other? Um, they also did the marketing and um, of co-op. Um, Ride, which Nazi shared, and y'all should download that. Um, Red Hook Transfer. Um, if y'all are in the uh, folks tuning in are in the museum world, y'all should really look to hire um, Red Hook Transfer. They're a really dope co-op um, that has a focus on um, uh, art installation and moving. Um, they uh, come from the art world of, of having done like a lot of art installation in muse museums. They were formerly part of a union, um, but then they decided to like have more autonomy in their own hands and became a co-op themselves, which I think is really dope. Um, then there's Radix Media Co-op. Um, they're a, a printer and publishing um, cooperative. Um, they've offered a lot of um, they offer a lot of their publishing services to a lot of um, nonfiction writers um, and have been a club that's been of service to the movement for posters and flyer printing. Um, and then Cards by Day, um, super, super great co-op that has been doing um, a lot of, has been offering a lot of their design art in the form of cards, um, bringing a lot of warmth um, through card making. Um, there's a bunch more. There's a bunch more. There's more film co-ops that Nathi mentioned. Um, and I'm excited to be in conversation with y'all um, because I would love to build more of a relationship with the art world and co-op world. 
Um, I think there's a lot that we can benefit from each other. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of um, possibility with uh, the arts offering a lot of culture making um, that could really benefit and bring healing to worker co-ops. Um, Cause just because you um, start a co-op doesn't necessarily mean um, you know, it's, it's still a site of principal struggle. Um, people are still coming in with their relationships to money and um, things like that. And, um, and how beautiful would it be to have, um, you know, to, to bridge our movements and worlds um, so that we, um, so that arts can like lift um, our movement spirits more um, and color our movements more, um, more deeply. And so going back to Nick Knock, what we do, um, we do a lot of programming, advocacy, member benefits to support worker co-ops. Um, we really try to funnel that city money um, as much as we can to worker co-ops in a way that um, builds power um, for and by co-ops, um, sourcing services, um, not just from any marketer, but like from a co-op marketing, um, like, uh, business um, and also to um, with with our programming trying to not just um, put out programming from like oh uh, a facilitator of like from this random person who says that they're a business expert but has never done a business we really try to center the work, worker owner experiences and thanks to um, what we've de been developing as the training collective um, a collective of worker owners um, offering uh, educational training um, in the service of empowering um, other worker owners. Um, but the heart of what we do is policy. And um, that has been, um, we have recently published our platform, New York City's uh, Futures Cooperative, a policy platform for and by worker co-ops. Um, this policy platform has been in the works for about four to five years of lots of grassroots conversations with folks across the sectors. Um, and, um, you know, the worker co-op movement is really big. It's really diverse. Again, I want to say it's like over 3,000 people, lots of people, lots of different languages. Um, and so, um, for us, um, as, as the policy, as a trade association focused on policy, we have been really interested in um, deepening the city's commitment um, and, and, and identifying like the ways in which the city can better invest in us um, and better invest in this movement. And to be able to answer that, we have to look at our shared issues and as well as shared solutions um, cross sectors. And so um, in this platform, we explore um, we explore the need to, you know, finance co-ops even more, um, more than the 5.05 million. Um, it takes, a, you know, just transition is not cheap <laughs> and um, like pub, uh, supporting the work of um, public bank, um, securing, um, what was it, more, more loan programs, um, you know, with our movement, majority immigrant folks, majority can't get loans from traditional banks. So, you know, for this work to really pop off, for it to actually mean something, for cooperation to really happen, like it, it requires a multi-prong, you know, a, co a cooperation amongst like uh, other movements. And so we've been heavily, a lot of this platform is an articulation of our own um, partnerships and collaborations with other movements like public bank campaign and CLTs. Um, so speaking of which, um, another policy platform is like the policy around space. Um, a lot of that is articulating just the need for community land trusts, um, um, not only to uh, stabilize housing for our frontline like community members, um, but to also stabilize commercial um, spaces and that's a conversation that's like very unique to New York City. Uh, commercial uh, residential rents is more a state level conversation and um, com uh, commercial renting is a city. And so there, there's a lot of promising conversation around that. Um, I will say um, 
education and technical assistance, getting more investment um, to WCBDI and beyond um, for, for technical assistance. Um, for me, I do comms. So what for me, what feels very apparent every day is the digital divide of um, worker co-ops not being able to necessarily like um, have the meaningful tools to like take up the space that they deserve digitally. Um, and what can we do to like bridge that gap? What can we do to also bridge the gap of like owners really taking control of their finances, really being able to control um, daily operations to really be able to um, create bank statements and, uh, um, and uh, profit and loss statements. So they have a really good reading control of where their money is at. Um, and um, let's see, city procurement is also a big conversation in the policy platform. You know, it took a coup for de Blasio to finally cut contracts with Trump Enterprise. You know, um, there's so much money that the city gets from taxes. And what could it look like if it actually was funneled right? The money is there and co-ops are ready to receive, you know, um, but there's a lot of advocacy work to do to pivot there. Um, and there's a lot of, th th that is a promising channel um, for, for worker co-ops to get sustainable work. Um, uh, again, we're trying to bring bread to the table for people. Co-ops can be cute, um, but they're, they're, they're only gonna go so far if it, it doesn't deliver the bread. And so that city for um, city procurement is like a really important strategy um, that we're trying to push forward. Um, there's been a lot of shortcomings of the MWBE program. Maybe y'all are familiar with it. Um, minority, owned, minority owned business enterprise. Technically the city makes a commitment of like putting away like $1 billion that would be towards like BIPOC businesses, towards our local economy. But like this, the data on that is wild. Like, let's see, like the Bronx, first off, half of that money actually goes to Long Island and upstate. It doesn't even go to the city. And then half of the contract that ended up its way in the Bronx, more than half of that which amounted to 14 million went to like this one woman, white woman led business. Um, so it's whack, but, but the contracts are there and they can be pivoted. There's just like mad advocacy, mad education that can work. Um, it's not the most glamorous work, you know, um, we're very eager to be autonomous now. <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, but, but there, but, that that is the tactic that we're engaged in in policy because uh, we are interested in delivering that bread to our frontline workers um and that's one very particular um arena mm -hmm. and then um you know this uh, we also in the last column and i'll stop here because wow mouthful um the last pillar being just articulation of like all the policies that, that need to immediately happen to protect um, domestic workers um to protect um, uh, immigrant workers from ICE and things like that. Because again, cooperation really, worker co-ops really ain't doing much if um, we're not projecting our BIPOC workers inside and out of the workplace. Thank you so much, Jay. That was, that was incredible. That was a lot of info, um, but clearly so much uh, robust organizing. Um, I think Nathie just put in the, the chat that, you know, the, the policy work isn't sexy without work is work. And if we really want to get that bread, like it's going to take a lot. Um, so we're kind of coming to, to the end of, of tonight. Um, and I, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who presented, who shared some knowledge with us. Um, so feel free to shout them out in the chat. Also shout out to everyone who showed up on this Tuesday night. Um, and stuck through it's been a really beautiful conversation and we don't want this to just be the first or the last and we're hoping that we can continue to um you know be in community and be building together um but as promised as, as part of our closing we do want to kind of uh open it up um to all of our panelists uh and um kind of hear from from y'all if you if there are, are questions um you know if you've been 
sitting on that burning question and been waiting for the Q&A. Time is now. Um, feel free to drop it in the chat or if you, uh, you know, if you'd like to speak as well, um, we can, you know, bring you up here too. Give folks a minute. Um, I think maybe perhaps as, as the questions are, are being formulated, um, I'm curious, you know, maybe we could do like a quick kind of one minute go around of like, just hearing what y'all's visions for dress transition look like. Um, there's obviously many and I'm thinking just of that image of the DOE building in, in LIC, like as like a slice of like the many possibilities. Um, and that's just looking at one building in one neighborhood and one community. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to kick us off and, and kind of share a little bit about what sort of your post MoMA future, <laughs> post MPIC nonprofit franchise complex future looks like, post Amazon future, um, not the actual Amazon obviously, but yeah. Yeah, I can start. So uh, as an economist, just transition means something very different for us. Cause usually for us, just transition comes up at like, what do you do with the workers who are stuck in industries that we're not going to need or want in the future right so like what do you do with all the oil and coal workers once we stop you know which we need to like stop pumping for oil and, and, and extracting you know stop extracting for, for oil and gas right so in, in this case i'm like what do you do with all these like museum employees that we won't need in a democratic future right so like you know i feel like we, we think a lot about just transition as like what is the thing that we're going to be, be, be building towards but i'm also like you know again in this context it's like you know, if you abolish the police, what do you do with the people who are planning who are, who are planning on that paycheck and that pension, right? So, um, you know, I, I I don't want to take too much time uh, on sort of sympathy for the, the 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 museum workers and executives that will be left behind, but um, we should spend at least sixty seconds. On it. So they got their sixty seconds. Um, so many things. Um, definitely the return of sacred indigenous art. It's always such a doozy to walk into the Broca Museum and see this one coca artifact. It, it always breaks my heart. Um, that's first, but that's not, that's just being a human. Um, and I would say um, I would love to see um, cross-pollination with the vision of um, worker co-ops, worker co-ops vision of having co-op hubs in the city. Um, we've had the vision of um, uh, there being like a physical space and then us taking over a block um, per co-op, um, per borough, um, and it being in collaboration with um, CLTs and things like that. Um, and I would love to it to not only be a space where there's it's a shared co-working space but like right next to it in the basement there's like um you know a studio um for band rehearsals um or you know art studios and things like that for for people that make that commitment to cooperative principles um i'd like to see Adrian or Milton, either of you want to share anything? Yeah, I can go quickly. Um, we talk a lot about futures <laughs> at Centro, uh, like cyclically, <laughs> we talk about these things and sometimes it's actually hard to imagine. But uh, for a just transition, I think, I mean, the main thing has been space. And I mean, I love what Dre said like about this whole idea of like space, not just as like a physical thing, but like even space to like, think and breathe, you know, that like you're always fighting for just the next month, the next thing. So it's like all this space that is needed for people then to um, start talking, really talking about what commitment to collective means, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's for me like a transitional timing, which will actually have more space, you know, like I would love to see us on the building uh, and that will bring its own things, you know? Um, but, um, 
also this vision of not having there's always a risk right like his, when we talk about the history of new york and there are um you know cooperative owned spaces and whatnot but then the communities that were surrounding these spaces are not there anymore because these places have been gentrified that is one of my biggest fears was <laughs> like i just transitioned is like what what do you do so generations of the people who are growing growing there remain you know um that's the vision for me because otherwise it's like I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It looks like we get rid of the classes, divisive term artists, period. And to think about what that's like in community with other workers, because it has an automatic register that signals um, a connection. Uh, uh, an elite um, group of people who have a monopoly on creativity. And to see the word being nor normalized these days is uh, also a kind of a, a it's a counterfeit, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a rip off that keeps people in the same whirlpool churning around and around and against each other. It's one of the most divisive terms. Going uh, back in the day, if I may, um, this, um, being on the ground, black people of color, indigenous folk um, were uh, involved in all kinds of creative practices, but that wasn't the people's word. That word comes from a particular establishment iconic and still about preserving a certain social world order. It lets artists who are so greedy play the, uh, the game equivalent to an unregulated Wall Street, get away with murder in communities uh, because of the strings obviously attached and, and, and it, it's kind of weaponized against the, the, the uh, simpler modes of being, in which there was an emphasis of being in right, white, uh, right relationship with the earth, period. Even the term indigenous, the way it's, it comes down uh, from certain heights, um, um, seems to hold a certain leverage when the truth is simpler than that. We are all earth beings, and this is uh, the, the kind of common love that we really need to move forward. Um, um, will still will be challenged if we stay stuck in the mire of these words. So thank you for listening. Truth. Thank you, Julie. I say that as someone who grew up around people who were born in the 19th century. I say that as someone who just lost an aunt who turned 100 years old and flawless health, mental, physical ag agility, telling stories that everyone needs to hear. Capitalism is grounded in youth, convincing each generation they are new and renewed. And this fallacy, which is a non-intergenerational approach, that um, the future hangs on the balance of the uh, people of the energy, sure, but the kind of least experience. How is it? that young people have all the answers if they did not grow up under uh, the, the kind of, I've said enough. I thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you, Julie. Julie also uh, runs a collective uh, space and project and, and land in Cleveland. Um, no, it's in a US from, law. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> it's in another, it's, space and time zone altogether. Um, but, you know, and as I'm thinking about the work that Julie's been doing, and I think about what, what Milton said a little earlier today, which was, uh, and I think I wrote it down right, con uh, the contradictions are now conversations, uh, at least that. And I mm -hmm. think That's we're great. all sort of caught up in, in the contradictions that we're inheriting from the systems that are, you know, we're still having to reach to foundations for, for, for the means of survival. We 
they still have to reach for for jobs in institutions that are funded by the monies that you know we mentioned earlier by by the monies of harm and violence across the world from Palestine right to Ferguson and and those are the monies that are that are bankrolling so much of the institutional lives and and so I just want to like just say the transition is going to be full of contradictions, um, and uh, and we just have to be very aware of that. And I think um, a, a great piece of this uh, I would love to see happen is what Dre sort of pointed to, which is bringing together CLTs with co-ops and 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 feeding each other through those means as much as possible, bypassing. Um, you know, obviously the legal structures are still part of the legal structures that were set up um, for other purposes, for private property. But every little bit is breaking down a little brick in that edifice. Uh, Abu, I wish to say one more thing. And that is one way to move forward to me is that there's, um, is, um, there's something. We need, artists need to mourn uh, their impact. They're at, uh, Wait, at we're first. artists now again? Yes, I'm using the term <laughs> artists because that's what they are. Artists need uh, to um, um, go through some kind of a cleansing ritual. <laughs> to that's just symbolic, or people can invent those things that you know. Think of re we're always reinventing the language, but looking at the connection. Have, I, I was in Soho before so when Soho was starting to change. I'm just in the 70s, the mid 70s. And then the East, no, then there was Noho, then the East Village and, blah, 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 and on and on and on. None of these things would be unleashed without that. And so why do quote unquote artists, and I include myself in that, uh, um, continue to uh, whitewash this word? What would that term be in other um, in other words, you know, and, and reclaiming language uh, like a sword, slice that shit up. All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to quickly respond to something that I think Julie, uh, I hope I, I, uh, I didn't mishear you, uh, but land and language, I think, yeah. Um, I think this is uh, something to um, say about the words uh, that I, I, I think I heard you say about like relationship to land, the right relationship to land. Um, that's something that, you know, it's definitely a conversation that we have. I mean, you know, we're talking about like displaced communities and like also different, you know, uh, the mixture of classes, right? Uh, and, 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 and the whole idea of like, um, even outside of an institution like a museum, you have, all this setup of relationships that have to do with like settler and colonialism, right? Like, with, which is not just about the relationship to land, but relationship to each other, right? And then how that shows up in relationship to land. Um, and I bring that up because I want to know if anyone has, not for right now, but maybe for the future, if people want to reach out. Because in our own communities, we have heard, for example, people talk about when we're doing, try to have conversations of the memory work of like, what are possible uh, collective ways to like own land, then this whole thing about our own histories of what does it mean to own land comes up, right? Even for immigrant families, for example, like first or second generation, like it's a very different conversation for families who have migrated. Like this relationship to like owning land that is very much tied to like settling, you know? Um, so how do you have this conversation collectively with people who are from the community about collectively owning land? when you also have to change this relationship that people have to the land here, right? Um, and I've also heard from people talking about like even CLTs, CLTs do have historically are complicated things that still hold these contradictions that are very much about settler, settler colonialism. So, um, you know, what things can happen, like if let's say a community like Centro wants to own a building, like do we have to enter, like do we have to, try to hold every contradiction or are some contradictions available, you know, like, are there other things like other than CLTs? If you're, if you're thinking about like, let's say, um, you know, immigrant workers actually get into that or to say like, we're gonna buy this house, you know, does it have, you know, what are the kind of things that like also might uh, disrupt the models even of CLTs a little bit, you know, because they have to do with like 
a different relationship to land, you know, or to the block, you know. Like I love the idea of like worker co-ops, uh, you know, but like walking through my neighborhood and thinking not of blocks as like oh this is where the store is, but like oh this is where this co-op is at, or this is where the other co-op is at, you know. Um, which I actually do remember from like back in Ecuador. Um, so there's some understandings of that. So yeah, just throwing all those things out there. <laughs> Um, how about the word collectively stewarded? <laughs> you know, because what is ownership as, you know, in relationship to, I mean, the whole concept is wrong. We're here temporarily in the first place and so many levels, again, the language. A friend of mine who's driving this car <laughs> um, often talks about sla quote unquote um, slave words, you know, um, shifting the, the conversation around anyway. that again I've said enough thank you for listening and sharing I think you're doing amazing work I'm so heartened by this conversation I'm uh, involved in a, a 1949 co-op and um any any uh, so I've been thinking about these things a long time and people say do you own the building and given the hardship that afflicted the the, the people trying to hold on to the building all these decades. I, it's like uh, owning a, a grief. I didn't want that. I just wanted to be like my peoples, my ancestors, the people that I grew up around who, um, you know, would, had a very uh, sensitive relationship to the word ownership, having fled lynchings, having fled all kinds of things. Yeah, ancestors. I love what you said about the um, about youth because it's also about severing the ties, intergenerational ties, uh, as well. You know, I think that's really a big part of uh, that kind of you know claim on youth that capital keeps keeps having a kind of like ongoing seduction through material goods. Uh, you know. Um, that 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 when you don't have the ancestors or the connection to to the elders, that is much more uh, can dominate it much more easily, I think. Um, all right, so we're we're at eight thirty. I think we are. Uh, you know, we're at the end of the uh, end of the session. Um, I, I want to thank the panelists but well maybe i don't know is there anybody with a question who wants to jump in just one last one or do we um um i think since i think we're done we are out of time all right um i want to respect that it's people got ninos that are sleeping and yeah. <laughs> we gotta wrap <laughs> yeah okay well well why don't basma <laughs> let's wrap yeah i mean i guess we kind of just said it but Big thanks to everyone. Um, we really want this to be an ongoing conversation. And so if you are new to kind of like the MoMA Divest crew, we definitely want to continue to build. Um, so please like be in touch. We have obviously like emails for folks so we can go ahead and like follow up and send out some of the, the resources. There were so many that were shared tonight. Um, but if you know you do the whole social media thing, you can follow us MoMA Divest on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, definitely check out Art Co-op. Um, and the report that Nati had, had referenced earlier, um, it's abundant in many ways as we talk about a world of abundance. Um, and yeah, I think Abu had mentioned, you know, we're hoping to kind of continue this sort of series around just transition, thinking um, about how that connects to land, how that connects to food, how it connects to all of the pieces of our life that nourishes and sustains us and, um, you know, how, how we're gonna just continue to, to build together and collectively. Um, so, so thank you all. <laughs> that's, that's really all we've got. Um, this was kind of mostly recorded, so um, we can also go ahead and, and plan to share out the, the recording with folks as well. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have thank a you, everyone. Present. Have a great thank night. Everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Julie. Bye, bye, Julie. Much love to everybody. Love. Peace out. <laughs>